Hey there, welcome to the Bible in Five. This week uh, you're going to be reading in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, Mark is the shortest of all of the four Gospel narratives in the New Testament. And there's a good reason for that. It's because Mark has the least amount of the teachings of Jesus. In other words, uh, Mark includes a number of the traditional teachings of Jesus, the parables and so on. But uh, mostly this book is full of Jesus acting. His, his sayings are usually very short, and it's more about his sayings explain his actions. I think of Mark as like the comic book action gospel. It's just full of Jesus doing things. Uh, it begins with Jesus being brought onto the scene, introduced by John the Baptist, and it's connected uh, to a passage right away through Isaiah 40, showing that Jesus is the culmination, he's the continuation of the storyline of the Old Testament. He comes as the one uh, who will bring salvation in the kingdom of God, as Israel's Messiah. And so uh, the first nine chapters of the book here is Jesus operating in and around his home, his home country, where he grew up in the region of Galilee, up in the north. And this is just action-packed stories, story after story of Jesus healing, performing wonders, uh, and acting in, acting in power. In fact, that's what these first nine chapters are really trying to show you. Jesus is Israel's Messiah, and he comes to bring the kingdom, the healing kingdom of God's justice and righteousness here, here on earth. And as an interesting feature in these stories, as Jesus acts in power, people begin to recognize that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. But what Jesus does consistently, this is a theme you'll find in these early chapters, when people announce or proclaim, ah, it's Jesus, he's the Messiah, he always tells them to be quiet, not to tell anybody else. And that's because he knows and he begins to, to realize in the story you can see that people are going to misunderstand what it means for him to be the Messiah acting in power. They'll think that he's come to be like a warrior or to beat Rome with a sword or through battle or something. That is not what he's here for. And so in chapter 10, uh, there's just three years of events are summarized here in these early chapters. In chapter 10, he makes the decision to go to Jerusalem for Passover week. Years are, are contained here in these early chapters. The final chapters are just talking about one week of Jesus' life. And what Jesus begins to start doing here in chapter 10 and onward is he's showing that the power that he has as Israel's Messiah, the power of the kingdom of God, is not going to be made manifest through Jesus going to war with Rome. But rather, it's, it's going to happen by him becoming the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, who will die on behalf of Israel and the world, uh, the world's sins. And so these chapters here, Jesus comes into Jerusalem, he's hailed as the Messiah, but again, he just goes right to work, acting in power and confronting Israel's leaders. He confronts them with the reality that they've lost their vocation. Israel has forgotten its mission for which it was chosen, redeemed out of Egypt back in the first place, which was to be a light to the nations. And so what happens is Jesus' confrontations with the Jewish leaders become more and more intense, and they end up with Jesus getting uh, arrested, put on a trial, and executed on the cross. But what all of the story has been leading you up to see is that the cross is not some unfortunate accident. This is Jesus acting in power. The cross is Jesus' power, because it's there that he suffers and absorbs the sins of the world into himself, and that his power is, uh, comes in laying down his worldly power uh, and dying on behalf of others. And then the gospel ends with just eight verses here, chapter 16, verses 1 through 8, with uh, the, the resurrection narrative, kind of. Chapter 16 is kind of complex. You'll see some notes in most of your Bible translations that verses 9 through 20 are not in the original manuscripts of the Gospel of Mark. And so what uh, these uh, verses, they were added later on, uh, sometime after the Gospel of Mark. So they're not a part of the original ending. The original ending is right here in chapter 8. If you want more information about that, uh, download the weekly Bible guide handout on the Gospel of Mark. I'll, I'll explain that in a little more detail. But the original Gospel ends in verse 8. And it ends actually not with the resurrection, but with the empty tomb. And so the women come, the women connected to the disciples, they come to the empty tomb, they, they see that it's empty, Jesus isn't there, and they are told that he has been raised from the dead. And they're told to go and tell others that he's been raised from the dead. And this is a very powerful way for Mark to end his gospel, because he's led you on this journey to realize the, the messianic identity of Jesus, that he comes in power to lay down his life and die for others, that he's conquered death, 
and that this is good news for all humanity. Are, the, are his disciples going to go and tell? And this is Mark's way of throwing the ball into your court now as the reader. As you've been learning about Jesus' identity through the storyline of the gospel, and you realize that the tomb is empty, he's been raised from the dead, are you going to go and tell? And then the gospel ends. So uh, this is a very powerful story that really, at the, by the end of the story, if you've come to learn who Jesus is, the question is all directed at you uh, by the end of the story. Are you going to go and tell if you've become convinced of Jesus' identity uh, as the Messiah? So it's a very powerful book, uh, action-packed Gospel of Mark. Uh, I, hope, uh, I hope it's a good, good read for you. We'll see you next week.